Hey everyone, today we're on the trail with Ben Bradbury. Ben is a master communicator and through his company Astutely, he helps people build powerful relationships with empathetic communication. I think during times like these, we could all do with having a bit more empathy, so I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with Ben. He has an air of Matthew Walker combined with a hint of Simon Sinek. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ben Bradbury. Okay, we're on, Mr. Ben Bradbury. Thanks very much for joining me. It's been a while since we last spoke and an absolute pleasure. Absolutely, Tom. Thanks for having me on. So I wanted to speak to you today because you've got a really interesting take and combination of insights into a lot of industries and trends and topics, which I think are intersecting at the moment, be it effective communication, education, knowledge work, podcasting, personal media and how are those sort of things intertwine would that be a mm -hmm. fair assessment of some of the things that you are currently thinking about yeah I, th I think that's a pretty good starting point i think it's also kind of prefacing by saying that there's a very broad playing field and ultimately i want to be playing the game where which i can be the best in the world at so what i'm interested in is where the intersection of personal media, podcasting, communication, like what does that look like for Ben and for my company astutely that we can ultimately be the best in the world at? And is it right you call this your subtlety? I know some people have referred to this as something like your personal monopoly, but I think you had another phrase for it if I remember reading it correctly. Yeah, good spot. So the subtlety is the first part of our five-step process, which is geared around empathetic communication very simply means messages that connect with your target audience's heads and hearts. You're a marketer, Tom, and I'm sure you've seen the thousands of messages which just bounce off your busy brain because they don't connect. And ultimately, the messages that drive action are the ones that connect to an emotion at the same time. And so that's why we start with the subtlety, because the subtlety is the key word or phrase that most people overlook, and hence why it's subtle. So for me, for example, the subtlety that really defined the start of my 20s was a victim mentality. I realized that I'd mm. spent 12 years in this victim mentality, feeling like the world was very much out to get me. And it was only when I saw the subtlety that my problem was brought brought into very sharp focus and I could start doing something about it. And so that's the same thing that we do with our podcasts that we create with our clients. We're always looking to start with that subtlety. Yeah, let's go back there. I think that's one, a lot of the things I want to dive into more detail on, but how did you kind of get to where you are doing your work with Astutely now? I know that you're working with individuals to help them find all these aspects of their personality and then translate this into some sort of tangible product that they have tied to themselves as an individual. How did you reach mm. this point? Interested to hear just like a bit of the background of how you arrived there, because having read your background, it's a really interesting path. And I wanted to see if there was a tie between your story from when, as far back as when you were seven, which I would hope you don't mind delving into a bit of detail on because I think that's got a really interesting sure. thread all the way through what you've done through General Assembly to what you're doing now with Astutely, which kind of feels like a bit of a, almost like a mini crescendo of a lot of the things that have come together to form what you are now and what Astutely seems to be. Interesting. I like the phrasing of the mini crescendo. One thing I've been thinking about for the last four years is to try and make every year my best year yet and so starting with 2017 when i moved to new york i wanted to set the intention that i was going to smash the year that i had there at the time so what your listeners won't know is that tom and i actually originally met in new york city we had a fateful evening encounter it was a great time and when i was there to set up a tech startup called glissa they're a fantastic company i was there to set up their us office mm. and at the same time, if I'm being really transparent with you, my second week when I got there, I was paying rent in New York and I was paying rent in London. And they are not cheap cities, let me tell you. And I realized quite quickly wow. that I was going to need some extra cash flow to survive. And the first couple of months were pretty rough. Mm -hmm. I 
didn't know anybody in this new city. I lost a load of weight because I didn't have, I couldn't afford enough to, to eat. And what I realized is that I was sitting on this asset, which was my LinkedIn profile. And so at the time I had this engaged audience on the, on the platform. And I thought, is there a way to teach people what I know on creating viral content on sharing their personal brands in exchange for a service of some kind? And so that kind of slowly planted the seed back in 2017. Now I'll pause there rather than jumping forward. I know you mentioned you, you'd like to go way back to, to seven. So I do want to draw the, the thread between them, which is that during my life now, I'm incredibly happy with the work that I was doing for the first seven years of my life. I remember having basically no problems at on my first school. I was confident. I was the lead in the school play, found my work easy. I had lots of friends. And when I turned seven though, I ended up contracting this disease called immune thrombocytopenia or ITP for short. ITP drops your platelet count to zero. So you have no immune system. And when this happened, the doctors had no idea what was going on and neither did my mum. So they rushed me to intensive care. I ended up sp spending a week in there and almost very nearly didn't make it out. And what this ended up triggering, it was an emotional downturn. And for the next 12 years, and it wasn't black and white, right? I want to make it very clear to everyone that this wasn't just a kind of like miraculous recovery story that the crescendo that you said, Tom, is much more apt. And even then I wouldn't really call it that. I think mm. it's just like a, a series of small steps, but those 12 years were incredibly hard for me to build meaningful relationships. I felt like, as I shared at the start, like the world was out to get me. And I couldn't really relate to anybody. And because I had this illness, I couldn't play sport. And so I'd use my intelligence as a tool to keep up. Spoiler alert to everyone, lying to your friends is not a good, it's not a good way of building relationships. <laughs> Nor is saying that I might not be as, I might not be as sporty as you, but I am as intelligent. That goes down like a lead balloon. So, <laughs> so, so I learned one. this. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, uh, keep that one to, to theory. So I learned this the hard way. And come 20, as I said, I had this real realization, which was the subtlety that I was missing was this victim mentality. And that allowed me to do something about it. It allowed me to start building meaningful relationships, which is exactly what we do now. And so jumping back to 2017, at Glisser, I was there to build meaningful relationships. Like I was very much grinding that skill. I was head of operations. So there was a lot of biz dev. There was a lot of customer support. There's a lot of hiring training. And so I was sharpening this, this skill, if you like, for the 11 months or so. And at the same time, running this LinkedIn ghostwriting side hustle as a freelancer. And mm. I made the decision in August not to continue with the company. I had been offered an extension of my visa, which I turned down because I wanted to see what it was like to work for myself. And so I went into freelancing in August, 2018 and started as a freelance ghostwriter and I spent most of 2019 actually out in Indonesia and Bali. It's interesting. If I had to sum up the one lesson that I learned, Tom, from eight months of living overseas there, it's the trade-off between lifestyle and momentum. So right now you're situated, you've got a home, you, you've got a wife, you've got lovely kids. And because you're grounded, you're able to push yourself that much further. When you go for the run where home is, when you come back, you can work those late nights because you know where mm. your bed is. You have that stability and security. And I mean, for eight months, I was living out of a 20 kilo suitcase and I was trying to write a book at the same time, which was a botched project, which you can talk about another time. And five <laughs> kilos of my notes were these book cards. And so I was living on 15 kilos of clothes for everything like clothes, toothbrush, deodorant, everything. And because in Bali, you have to leave the country every 30 days, which was part of our plan when I moved was to go and see a lot of Southeast Asia, which I'm very happy that I did, but it came at the cost of momentum. And I realized I was sitting mm, down having a smoothie bowl one day because of course, because I'm in Bali. And I thought being productive here, it feels like there's a 10% incline just to get anything done. And it feels like some days I'm wading through honey to work. And so like I could surf, I could go to the beach, I could do ecstatic dance, I could do all these great things, but I didn't have that local momentum. 
And so what's been really interesting to come full circle since moving back to, to the UK in December, 2019 was when I really started to take my business seriously. And in 2020 made the call to move from a freelancer by myself to a founder and start productizing what we do for clients. And that's the birth of Astutely, which is our marketing agency, which is enabling clients to build powerful relationships with empathetic communication, those messages that connect with people's hearts and heads. So I know that was a bit of a long thread. I'm interested to see what kind of dots you you picked up on there that we might be able to connect. Yeah, that's a really interesting story. And I think I completely agree with you in terms of working momentum in particular, because I think it's something which easy, it doesn't really get spoken about in public, especially not in the circles I reside in. And maybe it's because people are working in different types of work because a lot of people speak about the barley dream and we're going to be digital nomads but right they don't speak about the lack of consistency or working from coffee shops you're not going to be as effective as somebody who's got a home office set up in a controlled environment who is has high speed internet and reliable and exactly and all the other bits that go with controlling your environment your like mental stability what you're doing at an exact point in the day you don't have to have that background anxiety of having to leave the country every 30 days and i think there's a lot to be said from that and don't get me wrong it that is an incredible experience and one that i think everybody should probably do on the traveling side but if you're going to be looking to build a consistent business maybe there's some better options but i think just to draw the line from where i think astutely is coming in now it's interesting to see how that empathetic communication thread has come it seems to be all the way from school because having a a bit of a rough time at school at a certain point did that maybe come all the way through to okay if there's one thing that i'm gonna focus on which i have some specific knowledge around it's probably that yeah interesting question so one of the big breakthroughs that i had four years ago which was i went through a period of pretty bad depression in my final year of uni and i was working with a close family friend to have some therapeutic conversations and she said ben you're not an angry person you just feel angry a lot of the time that was a huge light bulb mm. moment for me because that's when i could separate this monkey software that I'd been running on this primate within from who I actually was. And so I started examining my emotions and that's through the practice of meditation. And so this is something that I think about a lot it, with empathetic communication. We are trying to deliver an, a specific emotion to the customers, to the employees that we're targeting. And what I find interesting, Tom, having reflected on this and going through a quite intensive multi-year process in, in discovering this is that it really came down to one emotion for me and that's the emotion of feeling understood when you feel understood you can become the person you were born to be because feeling understood i define as when someone matches your emotional frequency so when you have a conversation with a close friend or with your wife and you have this voice in the back of your head where you think man this person gets me or she really gets me. When you have that going off in your head, that's when you feel understood. That's when you feel seen and mm. heard. And when that happens, that's when customers buy your product. That's when investors want to invest in your business. That's when talent wants to work with you. And this was really, to come back to your question, the thread that has been my personal narrative because from seven to 20, I didn't feel understood. And because I didn't feel understood, I couldn't realize my potential. I couldn't build meaningful relationships. And that's the, the thread that's been powering me ever since is that I now know what it like, what it is like to feel understood. I've seen how life-changingly powerful that is. And that's why I want to bottle that feeling up and give it to the clients that we have at Astutely and the audience that we serve with our podcast. Yeah, that's interesting. It's almost like put in the most simple terms, just playing to your strengths. And it's immediately obvious when you speak to somebody who isn't in comparison to somebody who completely is. And usually this kind of happens when somebody tries a lot of ideas and it isn't the right fit, but then something just clicks and you think, okay, what this person is doing clearly matches their their voice, 
their mm. background, their unique knowledge, and these kind of bits like fit together. And you can get by, I think, in life and in work with trying to fit a square peg in a round hole to give a completely mm. useless analogy there. But the you can get by with a, you can get some by, margin of talent. Thrive, right? 100%. And a lot of people don't ever get to that thriving point because it's thinking, okay, this is okay. This pays the bills. They get trapped in like the career hamster wheel that, okay, I know that this isn't the thing I was born to do, but I'm stuck in this like repetitive cycle. Mm. I can't leave. And this is where I think the internet opens up so many opportunities where you should actually try so many different jobs if you can. Obviously now is probably not the best time to be doing that. I may add, but when things are back to normal, I always think don't ever stick unless it feels absolutely correct. If, you, if something's off, even at the first few weeks of a job or something you're trying, just, just switch. And then eventually you find this match almost by accident. You, you stumble into it and you're thinking, huh, okay, this feels, I'm getting paid to do something which feels like play and feels like work for mm. other people. And then once you find that, it feels like you should probably go double down on that thing. Yeah, interesting. I, I'd be curious to to hear from you because when we originally became friends, God, four years ago now, your focus was very different. You were a marketer focused on viral optimizations. I thought this is clearly a sharp dude, but your focus is very different to, to what you're doing now in the no-code space and building tools mm -hmm. that help people apply leverage. I'm interested to know what was the moment like for you when you when the puzzle pieces fit around no code and you realize this was the thing that I was going to be investing in? So the moment when it clicked for me is I'd always built like solutions like this, like trying to like connect things together without being technical from like 15 years ago, first from setting up my grandpa's trolley business on eBay for the first time. This is like pre-apps, launched a couple of projects, but then cool. fast forward all this time to when Makepad became a thing. It was, I joined the community because I had that itch to build something again. It was like a, probably an eight year delay of having to build something of my own. So I joined the Makepad community, just, I don't know how I even heard of it, maybe on Twitter. So I just joined and thought, okay, let's, let's see what's available now. Let's try and build something. And then spent some time building out some products, learning all the new tools. And then Ben put out an ad, the founder of Makepad, put an ad saying he was looking for somebody for part-time. And I saw the job and I was in a bit of limbo, wasn't really enjoying what I was doing. I just had a, an agency. I was doing anything online to pay the bills, building websites, like creating some automations, basically anything that people would pay me for to give me the flexibility to be at home for the twins. And then this kind of clicked. I was like, huh, okay, I've done a bit of, a bit of this. And when I first saw the job, I was like, okay, I'm not going to get that. He's obviously going to hire somebody else. So I actually got up at my seat and went downstairs and then I got to the kitchen. I was like, do you know what? There's like no harm. I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll try. So I'd sent through like a couple of automation flows that I did. Ben seemed to like them, sent me a couple of challenges to build a couple of bots and this sort of thing which again, it felt really easy, did a couple of videos and then that was that. And I was like, oh, okay, that wasn't hard. That was, that was something I, could, I find like quite easy. And then there was a talking to camera bit, which I was okay with. Obviously you get better at that over time. And then these few things click together. So some degree of technical knowledge, some wider knowledge of the tech ecosystem and what's going on and an interesting or a general interest in like emerging tech, what's possible versus, and also having some communication skills and not being afraid to speak to the camera or do things online. And then basically do the things that Ben didn't really enjoy doing. And I was like, okay, like this feels like play and now I can get paid for this. Interesting. Okay. Let's double down on this. Mm. And then yeah, like 15, 16 months later, this feels like a good spot. Great story. I like how the focus on emerging tech that you focus on kind of mirrors where the market is moving towards because i don't know when no code started as a movement i would imagine and you can correct me if i'm wrong it's something that started in the 2010s like it's fairly recent maybe the 2000s mm. but as a as a space it's very nascent 
And what I like about you and the way that you approach media is you're always looking for the next new thing. So I've recently got our team onto Descript and your overdub Descript video went viral. The uh, Andrew Mason, the CEO <laughs> was, was on it. And I thought, this is great. Like you, you really, to me, strike me as a lightning rod for emerging technology, just because of the way that you see the world anyway. Mm. So it's interesting and cool that your job gets to reflect that natural strength. Yeah. And it was one of those things where the shiny object syndrome that I have is just always being interested in the next thing or what's possible with mm. this thing. I wonder if there's a tool that exists to be able to do this. It got rewarded rather than getting punished. So it, it like previous jobs, I'd be doing the one task and you do that task over and over again. And I can stick out a job for mm. like a year. And then I'd be like, oh, like this is, I'm just bored. This is not exciting for me anymore. Mm. So having the shiny object syndrome tied into this world, which is moving so fast and the pace mm -hmm. at which it's evolving is ever increasing. So not only is it increasing in pace, the, the pace of the pace is increasing <laughs> yeah. week by week. There's new tools and technologies coming out that can be applied in different ways. So I think it's lucky for me that there is some actual value in the shiny object syndrome now, because tools like this can be picked up and used in minutes, hours, weeks, rather than learning how to code, for instance, and then sure. spending six months in a boot camp and then being a developer learning for 10 years, and then you can start building useful stuff. So this whole space is actually almost rewarding people who can learn things quickly, not necessarily me, because there's people who are much better individual tools than me. There's more technical people who are better mm -hmm. at building websites, better at building apps, better at automating things, but we're getting rewarded now for being able to learn things quickly, which is really interesting. The cool thing about the space that you're playing with emerging tech and shiny object syndrome, this I see is really mirrored in my world to the consumption habits that people have. So we've gone from hmm. Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. They had this speech in Peoria, Illinois, and they held the crowd, Tom, for three and a half hours. You couldn't hear a pin drop for nearly four hours. Can you imagine wow. doing that today without someone checking their phone, sending off a tweet, taking a picture? Wouldn't happen. Why wouldn't it happen? Definitely because of the media person. ecosystem. No, a hundred percent. You'd you'd want to document it. Like I'd be taking pictures. I'd be tweeting it. You'd want to have that interactive experience because of the tools we have available to us. And so what I think is mm. interesting is that there's never been a better time to be a shiny object syndrome person, provided you apply that to the discipline of learning. So one of the big changes that I've made in recent years is moving from wanting to complete a book, start to finish, to now diving into books for chapters. like. I'm reading Influence Cialdini at the moment, and I'll jump into a specific chapter, then jump out, great get book. the concept, move on. Yeah, it's, it's a great read. And, and the important thing is you don't have to complete the book. And likewise, you don't have to complete the tool. You don't have to master the script. You don't have to master no code. You just have to be able to perform mm -hmm. one specific function. And it's those building blocks together that creates the overall value. Yeah, that's really interesting. And we're seeing it cross paths, especially doing something like this. We're recording a podcast right now and likely doing something like this previously, maybe even a year ago would have taken a lot longer in terms of time, but also a bigger team. So you could now produce a podcast mm -hmm. and have it published on the web with snippets, shared out, uploaded to your website, shared on 10 different podcasting platforms within a couple of hours. Like that. Yeah. without much effort with probably about two or three tools. We're using Riverside FM to do the recordings. We'll probably use Descript to do the editing and the snippets and transistor to host it. That's pretty, pretty effective in terms of a tool set. And we won't, I won't use anybody else to do it. It'll just be me and it'll be done. So that's really interesting and leads on to a question I wanted to ask you, which is, what do you think of podcasting in general now? Because you're taking a slightly different, you've got a slightly different take on it in the, in a direction you're going. Well, everybody's going long form, like really long form. 
which I think mm-hmm. is great, but also you're looking at the shorter stuff and also you're looking mm-hmm. at something which is fictional versus nonfiction. Do you want to dive into that for a bit? Yeah, for sure. So with podcasting, it's worth remembering that this is a term that was coined in 2004. So the television was originally created in 1927, and it was only in the 1950s that we started seeing mainstream adoption. So the podcast is really this very nascent technology, just learning to crawl on all fours. And it was only in the 2010s with the proliferation of smartphones that people actually became able to listen to the podcast on the go. And that's the key thing to understand with podcasts is they're they're an ambient consumption. So I bet when you're listening to this, it's quite unlikely that you're just sitting at your desk taking notes. If you are, kudos to you. I want to be, I want to meet you. But if you are there not are that person, like that. you're yeah, there are definitely a few people like that, but they are few and far between. And most people are going to be listening, walking, commuting, cooking, driving, having it as background noise. But the podcast is really just getting started. So if you look at Edison's 2020 report, 51% of Americans now listen to podcasts each month. 70% know what a podcast is, which is just increasing by 3 or 4% year on year. So we're seeing the shift towards the podcast as a medium, I think, A, because of the smartphone, but B, because of the power of audio. And, and this is what I'm really interested in, is audio as a specific medium. If we think about the history of media for a second, Tom, starting way back with the Sumerians, with their cuneiform tablets, which were these st- clay tablets, which were baked, and they had inscriptions, which kind of looked like a series of L's, I's, and R's, which were scribbled. This was the original data. This is the first data that was ever captured. They would capture grain silos. They would capture about their cultures. And this is thousands thousands upon thousands of years old. But which sense do you use to read the tablets? Use your eyes. And much in the same way, when I look at my bookshelf, when I look at the books next to me, I'm using my eyes at the same time. Now, if I read Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, I'll probably be pretty impressed because the wordsmithing there and and the communication is world class. But if I listen to Martin Luther King's speech, I am going to be knocked off my feet. And that's because audio is like having a conversation with someone in your ear. You can be next to Barack Obama, Richard Branson, Sarah Blakely, any hero or heroine you have that's featured on a podcast, you can feel like you're in a room with them. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the, the power of audio for me. Now, Where I see this getting really interesting, and to to your point on long versus short form and fiction versus nonfiction, I think that a lot of the people listening to this, I would imagine that your audience, Tom, are pretty productivity focused. They're probably type A's, ambitious people who want to squeeze the most out of every second. And I don't blame you. I absolutely Mm. was that person when I came back from New York. I've since changed my mind, which is that sometimes I believe in order to speed up, we have to slow down. And that means easing off of the accelerator and being able to recharge our batteries. And that's part of the, the thesis behind what we're doing at Subject Matter. Uh, my podcast, Subject Matter, it teaches people empathetic communication, but we do two things differently. One is that they're short form episodes, so no episode lasts more than 15 minutes. It's usually between eight to 12 minutes. So they're very snackable. You can just get in, get out, get the value. The second thing, though, is that we are creating a hybrid of fictional and non-fictional shows. So if you think about your energy level for a second, Tom, and this is a concept that we call activation energy, your activation energy to read the Almanac of Navarre Ravikant is probably fairly low. Like he's a good person. You want to understand him. You like his ideas. Same for me. But there'll be some days where you've just worked a 14 hour day and you're burnt out. You don't want to touch a nonfiction book. You don't want to learn anymore. You just want to chill out. And this is where fiction comes in. Because for me, there is a non-existent activation energy to fiction. The barrier is so small that I could pick up a story anytime. And so I thought earlier last year, well, if I could pick up a story to read anytime, why wouldn't I listen to a story as well? And that's where subject matters, Mm. fictional episodes have come from. And the, the series we're calling is What If History? And What If History is based on a simple premise. What if history took a different turn? 
So our first episode is called is focused on Theodore Roosevelt's quotes, the man in the arena, which is an epic quote, would well recommend if you haven't read it already or listened to it. Whatever you Yeah, hundred percent. It, it's epic. And it's inspired people from LeBron James to Brené Brown, a whole generation of leaders for over a century. And so we ask on this first fictional episode, what if there actually was a man in the arena? What would his life look like? Because the people listening to this podcast, you guys are leaders, founders, CEOs, and you're, you're fighting battles, but those battles are often won and lost in the arena of the mind. And so this is a gladiator story, but it's a gladiator fighting a very modern enemy and so that's the the kind of premise i won't give away any any more but i'm definitely seeing an interesting opportunity to develop these stories where people can swap tension for relaxation and unwind with a story where podcasting has obviously done really well is it's brought back the long form conversation so let's say for me and you we obviously met like four years ago, we haven't had a long form conversation like this. And the podcast mm -hmm. is a great excuse to have one because you can, you can almost just come up with a reason. It doesn't have to be a reason in particular to have a conversation with somebody you're interested in. And more likely mm -hmm. than not, if somebody has a good story to tell or has something they want to speak to you about, they're going to say, yes, it's nice to have a long conversation with somebody without anything else going on but also it is nice to snack on information so like you were saying there is a time and a place to listen to a long-form podcast there is a time and a place to snack on information there's a time and a place to have long periods of deep work and then there's that period of rest that you need and like mm -hmm. you said with the fictional side of things versus non-fiction sometimes you do just want to mong in in for in front of some form of entertainment it could be audio for sure it could be video let's take the modern example of netflix just because you're you're maxed out your attention span is completely maxed out you just want to be entertained so lending to your point i think it's actually audio is a great medium and i think it is like you mentioned in its infancy this is why we're seeing popular mm -hmm. tools like clubhouse become so popular because this is this completely untrodden ground of just jumping in and out and listening to conversations whereas previously you have to almost consciously think of the thing that you want to hear and then find the thing that you want to listen to be it like a youtube video or whatever like an audio book or a podcast mm -hmm. and now you're seeing all these different mediums pop up where you can just hop in the middle of a conversation and say okay that was interesting now i want to jump into a conversation about space or science or food and it's almost mm -hmm. like snacking on it and you're almost like doing other things and you're passively taking in information so yeah it's interesting to think where that's gonna go is audio something that you are focused on at astutely with people and do you do you recommend it for everyone or is it best suited to say certain personality types if you're working with someone you think okay this person is clearly charismatic i think they're going to be really good on video or do you mm. say okay audio is something we're going to be focusing most people on yeah good question so first i think let's clear up a misconception which is that the biggest audio platform in the world is youtube YouTube is not a video platform. I will put up with horrendous video if the person speaking to me has got high quality information. What I won't put up with, by the mm. way, is bad sound. That's why the first thing that we recommend for our podcast clients, and to answer your question, Tom, yes, we do offer podcasting as a service at Astutely. The first thing we say is to get a good microphone because that is your A1 purchase. So with, with that in mind, how I'm thinking about media is we're an audio first company and ultimately the videos that we create for our clients and for me, it comes down to repurposing that audio as effectively as possible. So for example, if you're interviewing a team member on what they did well and how proud you are of the achievements they did at the company, that's a great way to build transparency around your company culture as a leader. I want to hear that person. I want to hear the sales manager tell me 
what they're proud of. I respectfully don't want to listen to you as the leader. The leader is really just there as the channel. And so the first thing is, I think podcasting is great for leaders, leaders who have to build teams and people who don't think of progress as me, but think of progress as we. So for us, our sweet spot is working with experienced leaders who are building a company, have a team underneath them, a cause that they care about, which means they're articulate, they're typically visionary as well, and amplifying that message together. For those kind of people, I think podcasting is an excellent way to deliver a message. And the other important thing here is the low barrier to entry. So a lot of the people that we mm. have worked with have not invested lots of reps in their writing. They might be okay writers. They may even be good writers, but they don't have the understanding of repurposing that for a platform like LinkedIn or like Twitter. And that's where we can come in because we can accelerate their ability to share their message. And so if I say, for example, if I, if I say, Tom, tell me about specialized knowledge, five minutes, go. You can go like that, right? You don't have to do any preparation and gold is gonna come streaming out. And so then where we come in is repurposing that per, and repurposing that per platform. That's the, the focus. And the last thing I'll say on this is that I think we need to rethink the term repurposing and recategorize it as resensing. Because the really important distinction in my mind for leveraging media effectively is playing to the right sense. Remember that I have a dream speech. Reading I have a dream is totally different to listening to it. And likewise, listening to a podcast, listening to a short form video clip is totally different to reading about that clip in a blog, in a newsletter, in a LinkedIn post. And so something we obsess about at, at Astutely is figuring out the most optimum way to resense something, to turn that audio into effective written communication, because they are very different ball games and we have very different goals for each piece. Yeah. I, I like it. As led me on to like another thought, which I had about, you said about leaders being good on podcasts, where I think content does really, really well for people is when people share their sawdust. So the analogy there is if you are like a carpenter, for instance, and you've got a giant block of wood and your, your main goal is to carve a statue or whatever you whatever it is out of this block of wood and in your head immediately the most obvious choice is you'll focus so much on the product which is like the final product but more often than not the most interesting thing and the thing that people want to hear about and can relate to the most is the work that went into that product and every single thing they got chipped off so let's use that in like a business context is okay, you can see a business which is earning millions and millions of pounds a year or whatever it is. And you think, oh, that's a really su successful business. Let's just speak to the founder about how they made it so successful. What is more interesting, and I think we're going to see more of it and the people who do content the best with these like behind the scenes videographers, some really not underproduced, but not highly produced podcasts and content mm -hmm. materials where it's just chatting through through the, through the sawdust, the creation of the sawdust, through the, the processes that happen every single day, the people turning the crank, the people dialing the phones, like the processes that are involved in that day to day, which is all the low level stuff that people can relate to. I think that is really interesting. And I'd love to hear more podcasts from businesses around that. So you, we see some mm. on vid, on the video side, but actually the cost to producing that with a videographer and they have to be like following people around all the time that can be quite costly but doing it in in audio form could be quite a nice way to deliver and i think that would go down really well i don't know if you've got any good examples of people doing it i can't think of one off the top of my head so maybe worth diving uh, trying to think about a bit more and bringing up some examples for for the future I think the gold standard for selling your sawdust, for showing people what you're building in public for a podcast comes from Gimlet Media and their podcast is called Startup. Mm. Now, before Gimlet even had a name, a man by the name of Perfect Alex example. Bloomberg. Yeah, he's walking down the street in Brooklyn and sees a problem, which is that he's a journalist with 20 plus years experience in podcasting and radio. 
And he thinks there's nobody doing these narrative, engaging, story-driven podcasts. And so what does he do? Instead of just starting the company, he builds a podcast around how to start a company. Now, I, mm. I listened to all of the first season of Startup Tom in about a so week. I. I was completely hooked. Yeah, it's, it's incredible listening, right? And for those of you who haven't listened, the key word to focus on here is transparency. Because you get to hear Alex Bloomberg's negotiation with Matt Lieber, who had gone to become his co-founder, who they, they very nearly didn't start a company together because they couldn't agree on equity. And you hear the numbers they're trading. You hear Andrew Mason tell how much he's going to invest as an angel investor. You hear, And the, the magnum opus in my mind for Gimlet is their episode, We Made a Mistake. And then We Made a Mistake. The Reply All, which is one of their first shows, or their first show, actually, mm -hmm. uh, aside from Startup, is sponsored by Squarespace to do an advert. And they contact this nine-year-old kid who I think has a Minecraft website on Squarespace to interview him. Now, where they majorly mucked up is they didn't tell the mum that this was for an advert. And so they, the mum is thinking the story she's telling herself is, oh, my son's being interviewed by Alex Bloomberg. This is so cool. And then she gets a message on Twitter saying, hey, I just heard your son in a Squarespace ad. And the pitchforks and the torches come out and the crowd turns on Gimlet publicly. Now, this is by no means a small issue. As a young company, this is something that can kill you. And BuzzFeed were looking to do a story on this. So this is serious stakes. The masterstroke in my mind, though, is how they responded. And there are three things they did really well. And you can fit this into a framework of own, analyze, and fix. First of all, Gimlet owned the problem. Alex Bloomberg didn't sweep this under the rug. He created a podcast talking through this whole play. You hear PJ Vogt and Alex Goldman give their two cents on the reply all issue. Mm. You hear the lady who made the mistake. You hear her breaking down on audio. You hear her say, I feel gross. It, I mean, it is very hard to villainize Gimlet when you hear the, the, the tears coming out of her mouth. So that's the first thing is they owned it. The second thing is they analyzed it. So they didn't just say we made a mistake. We said, here's why and here's what has happened. And this is where Alex Bloomberg actually interviews Linda, the mum of the nine-year-old boy who was interviewed without knowing it was for an advert and says to her up front, listen, I just want to say how I'm thinking because no one knows how you're thinking unless you say. And Bloomberg's transparency sells her. And she says, yeah, I, I I, I think that's how I'm thinking. You understand how I'm feeling. And now this is great up till now, but ultimately you have to round things out with action. And that's the third part of Gimlet's story, which is fix. Hmm. Because right at the end, Bloomberg talks through the three policy changes that he's actually going to make at the company to their advertising standards as a result of this episode. So you as the listener, if you're someone who feels like you've been wronged by the company, you hear the change that they're going to make. And that to me right now is the gold standard of why podcasting can be such an effective tool at creating transparency around a culture. And as Gimlet shows, helping us understand the world around us, ourselves and the company that we're building that much better. Yeah, I love that. What a great example. I remember listening to that podcast and I can picture where I was when I first started to listen to it. I used to live, listen every day walking from my apartment in the center of Manchester when I was working in tech recruitment at the time. And it was about a 25, 25 minute walk in. And I remember listening to it on that walk and thinking it was great. Mm. I, this is obviously years before now. So this is pre even me thinking about like doing a podcast, but yeah, just like mm. the, like the transparency of it and how it felt like, even though that show is highly produced and obviously they've done incredibly well from being incredibly talented podcast producers and mm -hmm. the creators of the narrative and producing these incredible shows etc but it, fe it just felt authentic and that's what i think works best for brands and which is actually interesting now that you can have brands spring up around individuals online so this is probably something which it's one of like the last kind of topics I wanted to dive into you with is we're now seeing the rise of completely independent people with audiences growing online, launching great businesses 
with very few mm-hmm. people leveraging these tools, let's circle back to the tools we were talking about before, leveraging tools yeah. in a really effective way and actually using their knowledge to provide themselves a great living, full of flexibility, fully remote. But one thing I wanted to ask you is what is the biggest thing from your perspective looking in that people are missing in media in general? This can be audio, visual, general communication from writing. And how could people do a better job of communicating online? This could you take it, you could take it in a context of either building in public, failing in public, being vulnerable to what you're working on, being sharing openly, whichever, whichever way you want to take that. So something I saw recently from Ross Simmons, who's the CEO and founder of Foundation Inc is this idea that PPC can work, content marketing can work, SEO can work, all marketing can work. You just have to find your channel. And I think something that can be quite overwhelming for an experienced leader or anyone really just looking to build their brand, as you say, for the first time is seeing all these options available and not realizing that you don't have to pick all of these paths, but you can really narrow in on your focus. And so that I think is the first question to ask yourself is where do your natural strengths lie? Are you an articulate communicator? Are you a great writer? Are you great with other people? In which case it might be worth videoing your meetings or having you present more, whatever it is, the odds are that you have some kind of strength in how you're communicating. And if it's not verbally, then maybe you communicate through code or through design, through the things that you build. And if that's the case, Mm. then show your work, sell your sawdust. For us, subject matter is our living, breathing case study of what Astutely can do. And that's going to be able to communicate our podcast's quality level better than anything I could ever say to anybody. I can just say, go and listen to our podcast. This is what we're capable of. And so much in the same way, I think thinking about as an individual, what are my strengths and what are the assets that I'm already sitting on that can that I can start talking about easily is a, is a great way to get started. And that's, I think, is maybe the thing that people miss is just how big the internet is. There are thousands upon thousands mm. of people who love the exact same weird stuff <laughs> that you do. I Niche guarantee it. And it, yeah, exactly. And it, it, uh, and to their credit, I think where the, the riches are in the niches gets it very right is that the more you're able to specialize the more you're able to attract people who like that exact same weird confluence of things as you. So being more open to express that, I think would serve people well. Yeah, I I love that. I think people tend to think they need to be a great writer and a great podcaster and incredible on video and a coach and a no code builder and an automator of things and all these things. But when they concentrate, let's just pick a random person, but one of those skills they're clearly much more effective at, they should double down Mm -hmm. on that. So the people who are great at writing and double down on writing do great. The people who Mm -hmm. are great audio and double down on audio do great. The people who try and spread themselves across all of it usually they don't dedicate enough time to the one thing they're great at and all the others suffer along with it. I mean, you can do all of them and obviously now it's never been easier to do all of them, but you are splitting your time. And I think, yeah, definitely focus down on one to start with and trying to figure out like, but figuring out what your strength is, right. Is, is pretty tricky and it is nice to have someone probably tell you which is which is again like a bonus of being vulnerable sharing online because you will get a judge of what isn't what is working and what isn't working rather than just showing your mum and dad who are just gonna say everything yeah i mean you don't want to be surrounded by yes men and women ultimately failure is feedback and so if something isn't landing that's getting you a tiny inch closer Mm. towards what could work I do think something that's important to point out is that there are plenty of people out there who seem to be everywhere. These media titans like Gary Vaynerchuk and Lewis Howes who have conquered the ecosystem, if you like. 
it's worth pointing out that Lewis Howes started on LinkedIn. Now he has the School of Greatness podcast, which he repurposes. He does it very well. He's one of the best in the world, but it still starts with his podcast. And so understanding that you can build these layers of media infrastructure on top of your brand as the years go by. But to Tom's point, being really acutely aware of what that foundation looks like is key. So are you going to start with writing, which then becomes the material for your podcast? That's very different mm. to scripting a podcast and then using that as material for your newsletter. It might look the same to the audience, but your system is reversed. And the, the process or the direction that you're going to use to determine that system, as Tom pointed out, is going to be your strengths. Love it. I think it's a really nice way to start to sum up. I had one more question before you closed out and okay. that is how how do people communicate online with more empathy because from what you think about what you mull over that one it is different than communicating in person and when people think about being empathetic it's about like those one-on-one -on -one interactions with people maybe in Mm -hmm. a friends and family environment or towards a coworker when you have actually have to be in like a physical space with somebody and you can get like a read of body language and all these little things that you can shape how you react to that person mm -hmm. and how you frame your communication style but online is completely different so i wanted to see what your thinking was around that sure it's a good question so when you're communicating in person, you're of course able to read the body language, see the subtle shifts of the head, the eyes gleam or dull, but it's all very reactive. It's in the moment. The advantage of communicating online is that time stops. You can be very precise with your outreach to people. You have weeks, months sometimes to craft the exact message that you need. And so how can people be more empathetic online or communicate with more empathy? It's to spend more time understanding the other person. Remember, when people feel understood, they act. And so read their articles, listen to their podcasts, take notes on their speeches, show that you've applied their notes and that you make them feel valuable. Ultimately, people don't support causes because they want you to do well. They support causes because it makes them look good at a fundamental level it, it happens to everyone it happens to you it happens to me it's it's the same for basic human psychology and so to be more empathetic put the other person first in your communication what do they need if it's someone who's many rungs above you in the ladder saying i appreciate that you're busy and no worries if you can't get to this giving them the easy out understanding what they value as well. I like reading people's about sections, if they're speakers, reading their bios, watching their highlight reel and understanding how they think and how they communicate. And then being able to find these points of connection between the message you have and making them see, hey, maybe this person, they remind me of me. So when you have these points of connection, they act as bridges by which people can walk over to build a relationship with you. And that's the real advantage of communicating online is you have all the time you need to build those bridges. The difference is intentionality. Yeah, that's a great place to wrap up. Ben, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. I love the way how you think about communication among amongst the other hundred topics that we covered today. And hopefully this is a first of many type scenario. Tom, I really appreciate it. It's been a blast having, well, you having me on and I thought we covered some great topics. So thank you.